Good morning. At, uh, welcome to First Christian Church, Fort Smith, Arkansas. We're glad to hear, have you here in the sanctuary as well as those joining us online. Today is National Children's Day. You know, children look up to us adults in their lives for guidance. While their personalities are unique, they develop their personalities uh, as they, as, uh, and their character as they spend time with you and me. So be sure to uh, say hi to somebody, say hi to children today. And appropriately, we ha have some help in the children and uh, up here outside, out front as well as in back um, today. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind as we go, as we pass the peace. Stand and pass the peace. <laughs> Playing, huh? Yeah. All right, gonna tickle the ivories. You heard it called that? Uh, yeah. All right, is that enough passing of the peace? Let's all uh, let's all get together here and uh, sing a hymnal. How about uh, 537? My hope is built uh, on 537, please.
Okay, let's see. This week we've got the board meeting, actually today, at uh, 5 o'clock, and then cabinet meetings after that, and ministry meetings after that. Tomorrow we've got, we're serving at Hope Campus. Then on Tuesday we have the DWF, DWF uh, groups one and two uh, in the parlor. Let's see. Also on Tuesday, lunch bunch at the vault over in Van Buren. Man, that's a nice place. If you hadn't been there, you ought to go try it out. Um, it's uh, it's it's pretty pretty cool too. Uh, next Monday we got the Disciples Men Fellowship, and then I also want to remind you about next uh, Sunday we have the congregational meeting, as well as we move the elders meeting then as well. So. Um, let's see, then reception for Ron Watson, our sanctuary interior designer, uh, next Sunday as well. So let the preacher, hmm? uh, heads up. Some of those next Sundays were next, next Sunday. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, I've never made a mistake from the pulpit, so, you know. <laughs> All right, uh, now is our chance to rejoice in good news. This is our chance to share birthdays, anniversaries, and good news of all kinds. Yes, sir. Birthday Amen. Today. Randy Alexander's birthday is today. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. A 25 year anniversary. Wonderful. Any others? Yes, ma'am. All right. Dwayne's birthday is Tuesday. Well, seeing no others, let's go ahead and stand and go to God with our call to worship. Our call to worship for this morning reads, In one spirit we were all baptized into one body. The body does not consist of one member, but of many. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge this morning that in the deepest and most significant sense, we are united. As your people, we've all been adopted together into one family. So we are brothers and sisters. People of faith, we've become indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and so truly we are one body. As Christians, how do you know that we profess a common Lord? So we are one church. And as members of this local church, we we sit around a common table. We celebrate communion together. We are one congregation. And yet, God, you know that all too often, uh, we too interrupt this unity. That it is not an uncommon problem for, for anyone to have to admit that their, their natural propensity is to divide. For we are petty people, all of us, easily offended, Sinful people, quick to offend others. Self-righteous people, quick to think ill and speak ill of others. God, you know that, that we all have a tendency to, to elevate small things and turn them into big things, to reduce big things and turn them into small things. And so we confess this morning that too often we fail to act in ways that bring greater unity. Too often, Lord, we, we deepen division. So we ask that you would forgive us. You would forgive our, our willingness to divide and that we would take that forgiveness and that we would truly live into the, the body that you have called together. We ask that each of us would be eager to believe the best about one another, that each of us would be eager to serve one another, that each of us would be quick to listen, slow to speak, that each of us would have a, a deep awareness of just how true our unity is, just how bound together we are as your people. 
We ask that you would extend this special mercy, this special grace to us at this time. Let us believe and even more importantly, live out what we know to be true, that in you we are one. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, 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 thy kingdom All right, the scripture today is on page 933 in your pew Bibles. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go uh, verse 12 through 19. Uh, preacher asked me to cut the service down a little bit, so we cut the scripture reading in half. <laughs> okay. For just as the body is one, has many members... And all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is this. It, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, "Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body," that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's going to be hard to follow that. <laughs> you know, growing up, uh, my mom was a teacher. I remember one day she brought home like one of those big rubber band balls. Uh, and I got a hold of it. I was trying to instigate with my brother. I remember I took off a rubber band and I was across the room and, you know, I tried to shoot it at him. First one, it missed. And tried again, tried to shoot it at him, it missed. I, know, I tried a third time and it hit, but, you know, it's rubber band from across the room what's it gonna do uh, but it got his attention and so he told me all right it's my turn he grabbed the rubber band ball tells me go you know stand on the other side of the room so I do and I'm standing there and you know I have my eyes closed because I figured that's the worst it could do to me is you know hit my eye so I'm standing like that and the next thing I know there's just a loud thud right in my stomach left a bruise and everything you know what he did took the whole rubber band ball and just chucked it at me. 
I learned something about uh, the first Corinthians that day. I learned we are stronger together. All that to say, uh, we are starting up a new sermon series today. What we're going to do is we're going to go church shopping a little bit. Uh, we are going to spend a few weeks looking at the different churches of the Bible, and we're going to be looking at them not for their theological content, but uh, getting a sense for who these people were that Paul was leading, uh, seeing what kind of advice he was bringing to them. And specifically this week, we are turning our attention to the church in Corinth, where Paul, he offers one of his most common metaphors for a church, uh, a living body. And so we'll get into that in a moment. But first, uh, with this series, with every church, we're going to read a little bit into the context of what was going on at the church. I have the belief that a lot of theological specifics really arise out of um, the, the context they're in. And so let's dig into a little bit of what was going on in Cor Corinth and then see how the metaphor of the body plays into it. See, what we have to appreciate is uh, we all pretty much get 1 Corinthians wrong. What I mean by that is everybody remembers one verse. You all know one verse from Corinthians, I can guarantee it. Love is patient, love is kind, sort of thing, 13th chapter. What we have to understand is that is not the Corinthian church. In fact, what that was, that was uh, Paul giving a basic description of love to say, y'all aren't really doing that. Uh, the truth of the matter is the, the Corinthian church, it was, it was Paul's troubled church. The whole letter, it starts with Paul saying, you weren't baptized into Peter or Apollos or Paul. You were baptized into Christ. He, uh, he's talking them down from having warring factions. Later on in the book, we, we see some of the most startling verses you'll read in the Bible. There's a point whenever Paul just says to them, I don't see sin amongst the pagans like I see it here. There's yet another point when he tells them, you do not have communion, for when you get together, it is for no one's benefit. I mean, any of y'all want to go to the Corinthian church yet? They were a wild people. And we can make a few deductions as to why that was going on. What, what we can appreciate is the Corinthians, or rather Corinth, was really a lively seaport town always had people coming and going. It always had a big exchange of ideas. It always had just something new going on. And so uh, what it seems to be happening is that the church just couldn't really stick to much. It was always just sort of brand new idea, pet project, that sort of thing. Just every week it was like the Wild West. And I think that context, that, that's important because I think that actually speaks to us as a nation right now, the, the situation of the Corinthians. They're warring factions, their brand new ideas all the time, that sort of thing. You know, the concept of uh, balkanization is basically the concept of, of the breakdown of a cohesive unit into these often competing smaller factions. It's what we saw with the Ottoman Empire, right? Whenever you had one great empire that turned into about 10 small empires. I'm not saying that's what's happening to America, at least not on that scale, but you know, we certainly can, can feel a little bit of that division. And what we see here is that that same process, that same sort of thing, balkanization, it was happening to the Corinthian church. You know, it's not that folks were trying to cause trouble, trying to divide things up. It's really just, it, it seems as you read through the letter that everyone was kind of doing whatever was right in their own eyes. You know, everyone's kind of shooting from the hip and trying to force their way, but it's it's just causing the worst fights you've ever seen because everyone's the self-appointed leader and no one wants to be the follower. You know, and so everyone's sort of playing this game of tug of war that no one ends up winning. Well, so at any rate, Paul, here in the scripture reading, uh, he's doing what he can to, to unify all these self-appointed leaders in the Corinthian church. And what he notices uh, throughout this book is that there's economic differences that make it hard. Some people in the church have money. Some people don't have money. Uh, some people, you know, came from Israel. Some people came from Greece. There's men. There's women. There's people who are uh, indentured servants, and there's people who are, are free people trying to be one church together. And so he, he notices all of that, and 
he notices the, the frustration that's bound to bubble up is that each of those folks tend to think that, that their way is the way. And so um, I illustrate that to, to point out that Paul, while he's respecting their diversity, while he's acknowledging the, the beauty and the variety of a, of a church being inclusive, of having all that put together, uh, he's asking that the Corinthians don't let that uh, diversity define them. What I mean by that is uh, what Paul's kind of doing is he's saying, you know, hey, you can be Greek, but this is not the Greek church. You can be Jewish, but this is not the Jewish church or the rich church, the poor church. This is the Christian church. See, whereas other distinctions, what Paul's getting at, whereas other distinctions in your life, they're, they're still real and true, they're still something to be honored, ultimately your baptism goes way beyond anything else. Ultimately, your baptism has provided you with a supernatural change. Each of us still to this day and standing as far back to the Corinthians uh, by the gift of the Holy Spirit have been adopted into a new body. We are really and truly in the body of Jesus Christ. And so, Paul, that's the first thing he really wants to lay out is that we're a member of something holy here, something sacred. This matters. Right? If everything else is a fight, if everything else is a matter of opinion and distinction, we need to be able to unite on that much, at the very least. We are the body of Christ. You know, to bring that up to, to modern times, what he's saying is um, we are not, first of all, uh, a Democrat church or a Republican church, or not even an American church. Ultimately, you know, we can have those features, but ultimately, we are still, to this day, a Christian church. That's our, our unifying factor. That's the number one thing that we can get behind. You know, the apostle, he's insisting that we are not, first of all, Arkansans, or Oklahomans, or even, you know, Texans. We're not disciples of Christ, or Anglican, or Reformed. We're Christians. We can have all those distinctions, but they're downstream. And we have to appreciate that the unity remains in place. It goes above and beyond everything else. And he, he says that because as he continues, uh, you'll notice that he, he illustrates that the health and well-being of a body depends on it being able to work together. You know, I don't think much about my big toe until I stub it, and then my whole body's laid out, right? I had no idea what an appendix even was, and then, you know, my friend has to go to a hospital, turned into a whole ordeal, that sort of thing. We're only as healthy as, as we are working together. So, in, at any rate, that's the first thing to notice in our scripture reading. We are one body. There is diversity among us, which is to be honored, which is to be celebrated, but ultimately we do not elevate any diversity over and above the unity that we have. We are ultimately one body. We have made that commitment in our baptism, and it remains true. It sticks. Now, the second thing to notice in this metaphor is that while we are one body, Paul goes to great lengths to illustrate, that doesn't mean we're supposed to have the same gifts. We are not all ears. We are not all mouths. We have an abundance of gifts. You know, it, it may be that your gift is going above and beyond to love on others. It may be that, that your gift is planning ahead and finding ways that, that we can serve the church and serve others. It may be that, that you're gifted at teaching good class, or that sort of thing. You know, I'm sure you all have heard a sermon on that before, but, but to, to stress the point, Paul, he is saying that the church works whenever the church is working in cooperation, not competition. The church is beautiful and lovely whenever we are Christ's body and we are playing out like a symphony, not a, a series of solos, you see. And so we have to recognize the diversity of gifts we have both knowing what we're gifted in and also knowing that there's gifts that we don't have any clue about. There's things that each of us are great at that God has specially brought into us that, has, that is manifested through us, and there's things that we can tell one way from the other on. That's true for every one of us. We all have our own gifts, and we all have things that 
we probably need to stay out of that lane on. You know, the violins, they don't need to play the cello's part, vice versa is true too. You have no room to, to assert, well, you know, it's really my gifts or it's really those gifts. The symphony, see that, that's the point he's making. Really and truly, the body of Christ, it works, to get, it works when it works together, when it's cooperation, not competition. So the first thing we noticed in Paul's image of the church as a living body uh, was that each of us ought to uplift one another. You know, we're only as healthy as we are healthy together. If one of us suffers, we're all called to suffer together. If one of us rejoices, we're all called to rejoice. It should just be a, a natural thing. When one part of your body's feeling good, it all feels good, that sort of thing. The second thing we noticed is that we all have gifts. You know, none of us are the exact same, and that's actually a really good thing. Can you imagine a church just full of Nick Kuntzes? My gosh, there'd be a lot of talking, not a lot of listening. You know, just the same, it'd be bad if we, uh, if we were all a nose, no ears. It'd be bad if we all had the greatest steward, stewardship or whatever it may be uh, ministry, but we had no membership ministry. That's just a hypothetical. Our stewardship and membership are both great, by the way, but you know. But this last thing that I want to draw our attention to is Paul, he illustrates then that uh, it is vital that we live into being the body of Christ. See, what I need, think needs to be stressed is that Paul, he really and truly understands the church to be the actual body of Christ, like the, the actual body of Christ. You know, if someone's lonely and hurting, where are they supposed to find the presence of Jesus Christ in our modern world? Well, Paul, he would argue that's a simple question. You find it in the body of Christ. Someone's starting over and needs some help. Who do they go to? Go to the body of Christ. Someone needs to hear good news, needs to refresh in their hearts. If injustice is being done, if aid needs to be made to some people, where do they go? Where should they turn? If not the body of Christ, where? You see the importance that Paul has of this, this group of ragtag folks in Corinth. He is saying, they are really and truly, through the use of their gifts, through their cooperation, are something greater than the individual parts. But on their own, they aren't doing much of anything, but together, they are really and truly something divine. They are the body of Christ. Y'all know I preached a sermon a while, on this a while back, but to remind ourselves, the way we talk about God and the way um, the Bible talks about God are sometimes at odds. Uh, more specifically, the Bible does not talk about a big man up in the clouds making every last thing happen. Instead, the Bible, it talks about a God who's invading this world, a God who has been alienated from his own creation, and through selfless love, through transformative justice, through ultimately the person of Jesus Christ, is invading in. The Bible calls it the periusa, if you want to get technical. God has set up outposts in Corinth. Next week we'll see in Philippians, we'll see in the Romans as well. We'll see even in Fort Smith, God has set up outposts that are a competing kingdom, that are an invading army of selfless love, transformative justice, a people who are unified for no other reason than we have work to do. So I want us to hold on to that concept as we go throughout this series. Now we are not, not here to just have Sunday service. We're here to prepare ourselves. We're an invading army, an army of peace, an army of love, an army of selflessness and of restorative justice. When we gather in unity, when we seek to be Christ's body, when we buck the trend that the whole nation seems to be going down and, and stick it out together, really and truly, we are supporting the invasion of Jesus Christ into this world of his selfless ways, his transformative love into this world. To so recap, being the church matters. We are a body that uplifts one another. We are a body that honors the variety of gifts that we have. We are, as Paul sees it, the quite literal body of Christ. If not here, where? First Peter, I'll close with this. First Peter 2, it describes 
the church, sending back to Corinth all the way to today until Christ calls us home as a royal priesthood, a scattered, dispersed people all across the earth, outposts that are meant to call and collect in all those who are in need. So may we live into it. Awesome. From John chapter 1, 35 through 42, when Jesus was asked a question that showed the people who asked it were interested in knowing more about him, he simply replied, come and see. There are a number of ways that we can see more of and understand more of Jesus, and one of them is before us right now, here at the table. We see the symbols of bread and cup that remind us that Jesus is willing to give his own life in his service to God and to others. Through that freely given life, he broke the chains that sin and death held us in, freeing us to be able to live lives, live lives uh, like his, all service to God and others. Here at First Christian, we celebrate open communion, where all are welcome. After the preacher's word of institution, come up from the outside aisles and then take the elements and then return through the middle aisles. We recall that on the night Jesus was be betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, as was his custom. He blessed it, he broke it, he thanked God for it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. 
in a similar way he took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he thanked God for it. He blessed it, and he said, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you. Drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. Let us come forward. Pray with me, please. 
O oh God, we ask you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and blood of your Son and witness to you, O oh God. Further, O oh God, we, as we lay before you our financial offerings, we give you all that we, we are and everything that you have entrusted to us. Come bless these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and glory. Amen. As a reminder, we do have uh, quite the evening this evening for a board cabinet meeting and ministries meeting. But for now, if there are any who feel called to join First Christian Church in membership, please do come forward at this time. Seeing none, receive now this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.